everybody, and welcome back to the women's game. Last week, we had such an awesome episode come out with Mal Swanson. It was so great to talk to her and catch up, but the episode was actually really difficult to record. Um, I feel like hearing about her struggles that I was learning in real time about her surgery and her infection and just the emotional difficulty that she went through was so hard to do in the moment, but I feel really grateful that she came on and was so open and vulnerable with us. Um, so a huge thank you to Mal for coming on and talking about all of that. There was so much big news this week in transfer news. We have a bunch of players who have been playing overseas who are coming to the NWSL that I'm really, really excited about. Chelsea midfielder, Jesse Fleming is going to be joining the Portland Thorns. Defender Jen Beatty from Arsenal is going to be joining Bay FC along with forward Asasat Oshwala of Barcelona. Bay FC is getting some great players. Um, it's so fun to see Jesse Fleming coming to the NWSL. She's joining her Canadian teammates, Janine Becky and Christine Sinclair. Um, I'm so excited to see her play. I remember talking to her when she was deciding that she wanted to go to UCLA and I was a senior there at the time. Uh, and a few of my teammates and I were kind of like used to recruit her to come to UCLA. I think Jesse Fleming is such a great player. She's done so well at Chelsea. And the fact that the NWSL is getting her now is such a bonus for us that we all get to watch her all the time. So I'm really excited about all that big news in the NWSL. There were also a lot of big games this weekend in the WSL. That's the English League. There was a huge West Ham win against Arsenal. West Ham was kind of in a relegation battle and Arsenal are title contenders. So to see those two teams face off and the result that happened, it was incredible. Um, I've loved watching West Ham play because my sister is on the team and I keep seeing Katrina Gorey. Um, she's performing so well. She's an Australian midfielder and she's really made a huge impact for this West Ham team since she signed in the January window. I keep shouting out as I'm watching West Ham during this game. I was like, oh my God, West Ham's going to win. And I was so excited. Um, this is a huge three points for them. And I think this is kind of slowly but surely just becoming a West Ham support podcast. So let's keep that up. Chelsea won again this week. There was this particular goal that they had. There was a beautiful combination at the top of the box that Mia Fischel um, U.S. forward was involved in for them, and Aaron Cuthbert was able to finish off the goal. It was such an awesome goal. If you haven't seen it, you should look it up on social media. And Chelsea remains in the top spot of the Women's Super League with that win. And NWSL preseason has kicked off. I'm seeing tons of content from all the NWSL clubs. It's so fun to see like the launch videos and pictures of all the girls in training. Um, I'm really, really excited. There's probably going to be some preseason scrimmages coming up soon. Gold's Cup, which is a big inaugural women's tournament featuring the U.S. women's national team and other CONCACAF and CONMEBOL teams, is right around the corner as well. That's going to be starting February 17th. There will be lots of international games to watch. And as for me, I wanted to share with you guys, my husband, Pat, he's a cook. He made us like a real roast dinner on Sunday. It was so good. It was like we could have been in a pub in England. We had roast beef. We had potatoes, carrots, he made gravy, and he made homemade Yorkshire pudding. I don't know if you guys have had Yorkshire pudding. Apparently, it's really simple to make. He made it in these little, like, muffin tins that we had. It was so delicious. I think I'm going to have to have him make it every Sunday. We didn't even eat it in front of the TV. We, like, sat down at the table and had, like, a proper dinner. And it was so, so, so good. So I, I'm highly recommending roast Sunday dinners from here on out. This episode that you're about to listen to with Lucy Bronze, who is Lionesses and Barcelona right back, is so awesome. I had so much fun interviewing her. Lucy and I played together at Man City a couple of years ago, and she's such a competitor, um, such an incredible player. And honestly, this interview was so much fun to do. She talks about how much she loves being in sunny Barcelona. We go through the 2022 England Euros win, and we even heard a little bit from her dog. So don't be alarmed if you hear that in the background. That's just Narla. Thank you all so much for being here and enjoy this interview with Lucy Bronze. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to have Lucy Bronze on the show today. Lucy and I played together at Man City for a season and we shared a small, secluded, socially distanced COVID locker room with Alex Greenwood and Rose Lavelle. Lucy is one of the most decorated players in the world. She is a four time Champions League winner, three times with Lyon and once with Barcelona an Olympic bronze medalist, World Cup finalist, and the best FIFA women's player in 2020. 
She has ties to America, having played at the University of North Carolina and won a national championship there in 2009. Lucy has conquered multiple European leagues between the WSL in England and Division I Feminine in France. She is now playing in the Spanish League, Liga F, for Barcelona. Lucy is also one of the pioneers of the women's game, advocating for fair pay on behalf of her teammates, and also serves on FIF Pro's Global Player Council. It is an honor to have someone on the show who is as obsessed with winning small-sided games in training as I am. Lucy, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. That was a long introduction. <laughs> I know. How do you feel about all that? Um, I think I forget half of it half, most of the time, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, it's like so amazing, and there's more to congratulate you on just recently. You were just named again in the FIFA Best World Eleven for the sixth time, and your club team, Barcelona, just won the Supercopa. How, how hectic have things been lately? Yeah, this <laughs> week particularly, yeah. we I had training Monday morning, flew to London, flew back, trained to Madrid, play against Madrid, then... Super Cup of final, then back in Barcelona. Yeah, it's pretty full on. Oh my gosh. What is it like when you're doing all that? Like, are you eating normal meals? Are you sleeping enough? Like, how is that like for you as an athlete? To be fair, it was, I was really tired this week, but I'd say one of the very positive notes of being in Spain is there's always siestas are fitted in the schedule. Like, you do not do anything between lunch and like 5 p.m., it's siesta time. Doesn't matter when, where, how, what, who, everybody's having a siesta. Well, I love that. I'm jealous. It's 3 p.m. my time here, so I'm going to start scheduling in my own little siestas in the afternoon. When I came to play for Man City, I really wanted to like gain experience playing in a different culture and learning about football in a new environment. And I feel like I did learn so much tactically, but more importantly, I was being challenged every day facing really technical players who were great athletes and who understood the game really well. You are a multiple player, a multiple time player of the year in England. So what are some of the things that attracted you to changing your environment and heading to Spain in 2022? Yeah, I think learning more, like I think like you, like challenging yourself. I'd obviously been to Olympic Lyonnais previously in France, which is different to England, but I think is more similar to England than what Spain is. I think Spain and England are almost like opposite strengths and weaknesses. And it's Barcelona, like, I live in sunshine, I eat amazing food, I play at one of the most historic clubs in the world, um, with, you know, all the best players in the world. Uh, so it was a bit of a no-brainer in that respect. But also, yeah, challenging myself to a completely different set of tactics was something that I really look forward to. Yeah, that's really cool. I remember um, it took Rose and I like a little bit of time to get used to like in particular the washing machines and the fact that like nowhere really <laughs> seemed like they had any ice you mentioned you're like in the sunshine you're eating all this great food it's barcelona but are there any little things like that that you were like surprised like oh my god spain doesn't have this i think i was surprised um there's like all shops are shut on a sunday which is pretty common in europe but then on a monday all restaurants are shut oh which I was like, oh, and the one thing I did kind of know this about Barcelona, but I think I didn't realize how strong it was till I got here, that Spanish is not their first language. The Catalan is, which is another another language. So they all speak two languages and predominantly they prefer Catalan. So it's a bit overwhelming do you understanding speak... two languages. Yeah. Do you speak Spanish? I... I can speak reasonably well in Spanish. In Catalan, I've got, like, good morning and how are you? And that's about it. Like, just to be to be nice because it's such a, a cultural thing here. Yeah. It's like all the signs, menus are in Catalan. They prefer to speak in Catalan in the club, which is amazing. But I feel like it's easier to learn Spanish because more people know Spanish. Yeah, for sure. Well, I had no language adjustment, thank God, because I would have had a really hard time with that. It was just English to English. Um... Okay, so Lucy, you're like a really special blend as a player of like great athleticism, strength, attacking ability, and defensive instinct. Um, and I can see you being, you're obviously really effective everywhere you go, but in a league like the NBSL, I can see you being so effective. And I know we mentioned up top that you have American ties having played over here for UNC in college. Do you think that any particular part of your game was most improved by your time in the States? And would you ever 
come back and maybe play in the NWSL? I mean, I've always kept one eye on the NWSL. Um, I mean, our Barcelona coach is heading there in the summer, which will be really oh. interesting. He's he's trying to get a little bit of information. I know I'm not American, <laughs> but I'm probably as close as Link to the States. Like, I had to tell him, like, you need to know who Mia Hamm is. He was like, who's that? I was like, trust me, just name drop her and they'll think that you're like you're amazing you need to know <laughs> yeah you need to know all these little names so we had that conversation the other week uh but yeah it's a, it's a league that's always interested me and i think to be honest going to america when i was 17 it was college but going to unc i think was the biggest turning point in my career i think not only leaving leaving england leaving home leaving being comfortable but in England, I was always competitive, and it was said to be like, oh, Lucy, calm down a little bit. And then it was like, I went to America, and it was like, no, Lucy, be competitive, be this person, be a winner, like, don't be afraid of it, embrace it. And I think that was the thing that set me apart from other English players. Then when I went back, I had that, you know, everything we did in England, but then I had that mentality where I just wanted to win everything. I think that's how my career's kind of gone. I just wanted to win all the time. Well, you're doing a great job, but that that did really strike me about you when we were teammates in England. I was like, Lucy is like the most competitive person here, and I loved that about you so much. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about your team at Barcelona. It's one of the most impressive and enjoyable teams to watch. The talent on your team is in- incredible. Alexi Pateas, Eitana Bonmati, Kira Walsh, who we both played with at City. Um, your team just won the Champions League in 2023. And you don't really strike me. I mean, I know you and you don't strike me as somebody who would ever get intimidated. Um, but did you ever have a moment in training at Barcelona where you were just in awe of one of your teammates? Uh, yeah, a few times. I had that at Lyon, but I think at Barcelona it was different. It was like the way that we train is so Spanish and how they play with each other is, I don't know, it's, it's just a different kind of level and understanding that they've got. I remember even Kira, who's, you know, a technical midfielder, she was like, oof, this is this is a lot. I think Alexia Puteas and Aitana Bonmati are obviously the two that everyone know because of the Ballon d'Ors and they score so many goals and exceptional players. I think I was surprised that they're all that technical. It's not just those two. I think Mariona Caldente is someone she played in the World Cup. She's probably goes one of the most underrated players I've ever played with and you just can't get them you can't get the ball off them it's like you go in a rondo and you just you could just be stuck in there because no one's making a mistake <laughs> you said the way that you train is so Spanish can you just explain that in like layman's terms how would you describe playing so Spanish like everything's small spaces everything's sm- limited touches it's just constant pass and pass and you don't tend to see much dribbling or you know bigger areas or bigger spaces I mean it doesn't really play into my hands very well I was like let me run there's sometimes we do the occasional drill and it's a bit like more headed towards fitness and the coach always comes up to me and he goes you like that one today didn't you that one was for you <laughs> and I think it yeah, because we never do anything past like a halfway line everything's so tight so small you fit like 10 players in an area that normal teams would only put five players in but the touches are so sharp and so quick and even the goalkeepers like they're joining in and it's and it's the level still the same wow that's so cool do you think that that um just that really like high standard of technical ability is that a reflection of your coach or is it more a reflection of all of the spanish style of soccer I think it's the Spanish style. I think, don't get me wrong, our coach is really good. He's super obsessed with football, uh, soccer. We'll say soccer. <laughs> Thanks. I'll, I'll do that for you. <laughs> He's super obsessed with soccer and like all the little small intricacies and touches and things like that. But all of these players have that understanding. Like, even if you don't understand stand on each other's language on the pitch. It's like everybody understands what we're supposed to do with the ball and how we're supposed to play. And I think it's, and predominantly our team are, you know, the the spine of the best Spanish players. And I think, you know, the way that Barca plays, the way that those girls play in particularly, you can see how it's then transported into the Spanish national team because then they play a similar way. And it's like the coaches and the staff is different, but those core players are the same. 
and everything stays the same because they have this amazing understanding and this amazing intelligence with the ball. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you can see that both with your team in Barcelona and the Spanish national team, obviously. Um, your coach, you might have to help me out here with the pronunciation. What do you, I just how do, call him what Jonah. You call, you call him Jonah. Jonah. I'm going to yeah, call him Jonah. Easy. He's coming yeah. um, to the NWSL and he's going to coach the Washington Spirit um, after your season concludes in May. But he's won with your team, the Continental Treble and a Champions League title. Can you tell us a little bit about him and his personality? I think you get this guy talking about soccer and you're there for hours. You could ask him one question and the explanation goes on to the whole team and the whole pitch and, and every every possibility that you could think of, he's thinking of it. I think he's someone who's, if you really enjoy learning about the tactics of particularly attacking football, you could sit there and listen to him for hours. Um, He's, he likes to improve his English <laughs> and he's very, com <laughs> he's very, very competitive. He likes to join in or he'll say, watch this, I'll hit the crossbar and he'll stand there for 10 minutes doing s silly things like that. He's super competitive as a player, as a coach, the way he manages. Um, but he's a, yeah, he's a really nice guy. I think, I think people forget he's quite young. He's, uh, he's actually younger than me, which is a bit embarrassing. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but he's... He's just, he was an he was an analysis before he was a, a coach, then okay. he was an assistant, then the full manager. So I can see why he has that understanding because he's just watched hours and hours of video and, and clips and he's just super obsessed with it, but a really good guy. Wow, that's really cool. Um, it sounds like he's super competitive, which obviously is going to translate to the American League, but what other things about him and his coaching philosophy do you think are going to showcase in the NWSL? I think from what I have, when I've spoke to him, I feel like he really wants to take his style of play over. Maybe he's try and get that Spanish style in a little bit. Uh, but I think it's going to have to be a bit of a mix of a, a hybrid. I could imagine it won't be easy straight away. Um, and obviously, I think he, he has to get used to this, the whole system of how you sign players and putting a team together. Um, he likes to put teams together and, and fit players in different positions to make the team tick all together collectively. It might not necessarily always be the best 11 on the field. It's the best team, uh, which I've noticed at Barca. It's like who fits together is like a jigsaw rather than just these are the best players. Go ahead and play. Um, so I think you'll see that. But yeah, I'm really hoping that he brings that possession-based play, build-up play that Barcelona particularly so well known for um, and from speaking to him he's I think he's excited for that challenge of bringing that to the states wow well the more you talk about him the more I am so excited to see him coach here it also sounds like you love it in Barcelona so much are you really happy there yeah it's amazing I think it's on such a different type of football that I'm someone who, I guess, I guess I get a little bit bored sometimes. <laughs> I don't stay at teams very long. Um, so then always challenge myself and th finding new things. And yeah, being part of the way that Barcelona play is, you watch it and it's something that everybody goes, oh, I love watching it. But then to be part of it and enjoy it on the inside is is unbelievable. And to like understand it even better because you're part of it is is. Yeah, it's pretty special. Oh, that's cool. I'm like jealous, but also really happy for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so unfortunately, women's soccer in Spain has made a lot of news in recent years between the poor treatment of the women's national team in the lead up to the World Cup by coach Jorge Vilda to the horrible actions of Luis Rubiales against Jenny Hermoso and also yourself at the medal ceremony after the World Cup final. You and Kira Walsh both were in a unique position in that many of the Spanish players are your club teammates. Um, what like conversations did you have with both your English teammates and your Barcelona teammates about how to best support the Spanish players in the fallout of everything that happened after the final? I mean, I think the conversations with both teams were so different. And I remember I spoke with um, Alex Morgan as well, actually, because I think the US has always kind of been the standard, particularly in women's soccer, of how you speak out and how you stand up for yourself and for others. And I think as an England team, we've always tried to follow in the footsteps of the US. And then then to see Spain almost asking England for our help and like being on the other side of it was really interesting. Um, you know, I think in terms of society and women's football, uh, women's soccer in society, they're a little bit behind. And I remember that was England a few years ago. So to kind of 
help them through that process was quite interesting because I know it's a, a place where we've been before. I think the England girls were always asking what's going on, what can we do? I had so many messages, not only from English players, but from players all around the world because obviously I've got that contact with the Spanish girls. Um, and I think for the Spanish girls, it was almost like they were like, oh, like that many people care about us and that many people want to help us. Because um, I think it, in the past, it's not really something that's happened in Spain, particularly for women's football. You know, you exclude Barcelona in the last couple of years and women's football hasn't really been on that same level of growth as maybe the NWSL or the, the FAWSL or international teams have, have been on that same kind of trajectory that's just gone through the roof. But Spain has the talent and had the players, but I don't think they realise in the head how good they are and how big they are and how much people want to help them. So it was, um, it was kind of difficult because I wanted to just be like, you guys just, just say something, just come out and talk. But then I had to remember that they're getting used to that and learning as a team what to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, thankfully, things have kind of gone in the right direction eventually. Um, but I mean, for Jenny especially, I think it's been the hardest. Um, I don't know her really well personally, but having you know heard from all the girls and everything that she's had to go through is, is insane. It's un unimaginable. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, obviously that was something I hope never is repeated. Um, like you mentioned, the NWSL has kind of gone through its own reckoning uh, with situations not too dissimilar, and it's definitely an ongoing process. Um, but we have to keep paying attention. Things are always evolving and kind of separately. I mean, we've seen recently that teams like Nigeria and Jamaica are having issues with their federation still regarding payments at the World Cup. And um, like you said, I think just as players, it's important that we maintain these relationships and know that we can all advocate for each other and ourselves. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think I think with that as well is that everyone always looked at the US and it was like, oh, the US win World Cups and... Carly Lloyd, Alex Morgan, like Megan Rapino, and we all know these people almost not just as footballers, but kind of celebrities in a way. Like they're huge, like they're global. So I think so many teams and players think, like, oh, I can't do that because that's the US and they've done this and they've done that. And it's like, you don't have to have achieved what they have achieved to have that same level of respect. Like, you have that respect and everybody's here to back you, which I think a lot of countries now are, are realizing that we're all in this together it's not just those one or two three four five names that you know that speak out everyone can speak out and we can do it together for sure wow i'm yeah spot on i'm so glad that you're one of the pioneers of talking about this and that you're you have all these connections all over the world so you can continue sharing this message so i really appreciate you saying that on here um okay i want to talk about england now you made your england debut in 2013 when you were just 22 years old um, you've gone on to play over a hundred times for your country and are now one of the more senior players on the team. What has that transition been like from being a young player on the team to being one of the most capped? I think it just kind of went in like the blink of an eye. <laughs> it feels like, um, first coming into this squad and I was with the players who I looked up to, watched on TV. And now when I go there, it's like a couple of the younger players and newer players are like, a little bit scared to speak to me and I'm like it's fine <laughs> I'm not gonna bite you but I quite enjoy being I'm like the oldest player and the most capped player but I quite enjoy it I end up with the younger players now I think Lauren James is someone who I spend a lot of time with she's one of the youngest players in the squad and I like just sharing in their enthusiasm so I think they're the ones who keep me young I don't feel like the oldest oh I love that you're young at heart Lucy um so the Euros are a long-established tradition in European football. The tournament is second only to the World Cup. Um, your England team won the Euros in 2022, and there were some really incredible and memorable moments like Alessio Russo's iconic back heel goal in the semifinal and Chloe Kelly's goal in the final. Can you go back and take us into that moment when Chloe scored? It was the 110th minute. What happened? Yeah, exactly what happened. <laughs> God, it was, I think, I was actually, I kind of claiming like a half assist on it. It was a corner, and I remember the, I jumped and the ball was like too low, and I think I, I kept it in play, and I was next to Chloe thinking, swing your leg, come on, hit it. It was it was like in between players, goalkeeper, Chloe, I was thinking just, 
do anything, put it in the back of the net. Um, and I was literally like a metre away from her, and I think I was probably, the, the apart from Chloe, the first one to realise it had gone in. And I, I, and then I was equally the only one that probably didn't go and celebrate with the team because it was like, yeah, this relief of, oh my God, we've finally done it. Like I knew once we, if we scored, we could see the game out. We're England. Like we know what we, in those times, we know what we're doing. But yeah, once the goal went in, it was, yeah. So what did you do instead of celebrate? Well, I celebrated, but I, it was like my legs just didn't move. Like I just stayed on the spot. <laughs> Everyone else was running. Chloe's taking the top off. Running, people were running after her. I think she was didn't know whether it was offside or. I remember looking around at the the lines uh, the lineswoman. I knew that there was absolutely nothing wrong with the goal. I saw. I think that was me, just frozen still in time. Like I feel like I was probably trying to scream and no sound was even coming out because it was just yeah. And I was so and I was very tired. Yeah, <laughs> very tired. That's fair. I remember <laughs> in 2019 when Rose scored in the World Cup final. I didn't celebrate with the team either. I like stood on the top of the box like this. I like literally couldn't believe that she scored, and I I felt like I knew right then that we were going to win, and it was just like too much to handle at once. I think being a player who'd been to so many tournaments with England and World Cups, and being in these close moments of semi-finals oh. and never quite making it to have that moment come it was just like oh my god and everybody all the all the other players on the on the pitch at the time were quite young um i think well excluding jill scott um but i think they almost it was like oh yeah this is supposed to happen like england was supposed to win the euros in england and i was just like it's not this easy it's not supposed to be like like it's not that easy like I've been to so many tournaments and so many disappointed moments and it was like they were just like yeah we've scored we've won the final wow I mean well that did like that was such a turning point I think for English football English women's football I think like broader English football fans have historically been somewhat reluctant to cheer for female footballers did you notice a shift after you won the Euros yeah, I mean, even in the Euros, we we sold out every stadium. We went from Old Trafford, um, a couple of other different stadiums, to then Wembley. We were selling out, and it was like, okay, this is the tournament. This is what's supposed to happen with the home nation. But then it just continued after that. It was like constantly going, or is it Wembley? And it, like now it's like, oh, we've sold out. And it's like we always do. It's it's completely changed it. Um, not just in that respect, but even the way our players are seen, both in football and and outside of football, and yeah, it's the landscape of women's football now. The league's completely changed; it's gone to another level. Um, I think Arsenal are a great example of that. What they've been doing. Um, uh, a lot of the teams now are playing in bigger stadiums because the 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 fans and the support is just like gone like tenfold I wouldn't even say double it's like tenfold yeah. it's crazy that's amazing um well you guys had like such an incredible world cup as well but in between the euros and the world cup you had four players who started the euros final missing from your world cup squad Ellen White had retired and then Leah Williamson Fran Kirby and Beth Mead were injured how did you guys adjust going into the world cup do you think you had to alter your style of play given all those absences I mean, during the World Cup, we altered our style of play because then we also lost Kira Walsh for like pretty much two games. Um, but yeah, I think it was it was something that we didn't want to put too much focus on going into the tournament. But afterwards, it, it's easy to say because obviously we didn't win, but it, it it put a huge strain on the team. It was not just on the pitch, but it was like experienced heads. Ellen retired, but also Jill Scott retired. Jill Scott was like this amazing glue person that just brings everybody together it, it, no matter what's happening um, obviously Leah Williamson was our captain in the Euros Frank Kirby's been one of the best players in the world Beth Mead was the player of the tournament and like we were missing such key players um, which did yeah it put extra strain on the other players who were playing um, and then a lot of youth coming in who you know you want them to have a great tournament and a great experience so it was it was definitely a different kind of tournament to the, the Euros, but I think all in all, when we look back to get to the final, we we lost 1-0 in the final to a Spanish team with 
oh, like talent that's unbelievable. I mean, I know that firsthand. Um, yeah, it's devastating that we we couldn't quite get over the line after being so close so many times. But with all those things going on and all said and done, we did pretty well in the end. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I, your manager Serena Vigman seems like she's had such a huge impact on English football in general, and she just signed a new deal to continue managing the team till twenty twenty seven. Um, led the team to the Euros win and then the World Cup final and back-to-back years. What's it like to play for Serena? What kind of manager is she? I think Serena's, she's got a bit of both. Like she's good at coaching on the field and then she's good at managing off the field as well. Um, she's quite direct being Dutch. It's a bit of a Dutch stereotype. <laughs> uh, if, but it's true. If, <laughs> it's true. She asks you for your opinion, you give, you give it to her and she still says, no, I'm right. It's fine. <laughs> she still listens to you. Uh, but yeah, she's very direct. She, um, she knows what she wants to do and how she wants the team to play. Um, I think as well, you know, she did inherit a quite a good England team and quite a good England squad. Uh, but she made the finishing touches that made us take took us to that next level. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're all pretty happy that she's extended her deal with the English national team. She seems to enjoy herself very much. I think she's also improving and developing as a person and a manager as well. And we're on this journey with her. So it's, yeah, it's really amazing. I think we're just happy that she's staying with the English and not going elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy for you guys. She seems like such a great manager. Um, like you said, your team lost to an incredible Spanish team in the final one to zero. And then also, sorry to bring this up, you guys recently didn't qualify for the Olympics. Um, It was a complicated qualification process through Nations League. We would need a whole separate podcast to discuss and explain (laughs) that. But um, you've been through so much success in your career. You have so much experience. And now you're this veteran leader. How do you process losing? And how do you help your younger teammates get through it as well? Yeah, I mean, it was crushing the way that we didn't qualify because it was with 30 seconds we were qualify were potentially qualifying and then 30 seconds later we weren't and even still now you know the european teams haven't fully qualified i think it's fair to say that it's probably the hardest continent to qualify from and in past years we would have qualified having done so well at the world cup but i think you know making the final of the world cup and then having to pick ourselves back up and you know, you know we were playing teams like Holland it's not they're not easy teams to to play against um but yeah we left it a little bit too late um and it's disappointing and I guess for the younger players it's disappointment that they've never felt in an England shirt because you know in in recent years we've won the Euros and we got a silver medal at, at the World Cup you know a lot of our players are from those two tournaments um, so to have to go through a big disappointment of missing a major tournament, although it's not England, it's Great Britain, it's still a major tournament and you want to be part of. Um, I guess we've all kind of had to take a step back and kind of, sounds sounds terrible, but look at the bright side of we've got uh, a summer where we don't have this crazy congestion of, of games. Uh, we can recover get back together, we've got a Euros that we need to qualify for next year and we want to keep a hold of our, our trophy. So lucky for us, there's still a tournament in the near future which we can regroup and, and put our aim on that instead. Well, yeah, I mean, you just mentioned you'll not have a world tournament this summer. Does that mean you get to take a break? I mean, you've been playing at this level for so long, 118 caps. How do you balance the demands of elite club and country with rare breaks yeah i mean i think this is the first summer where i get to plan i'm going on holiday with my family for the first time since i was probably like 18 or something because even before playing senior tournaments you know there's like the u20s world cup and we have the euros with the youth system as well um so i think I'm looking forward to taking a break. I think if you asked me this a couple of years ago, I would have hated, absolutely hated taking any time off. Uh, but I'm at a point now where I realise it's just as good for your body as, as playing. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, recoup and re-go again next year. Yeah, for sure. Okay, last couple, Lucy. Um, 
you're always pushing the game forward. You're talking about the issues. You always give time to your fans. You're like such a incredible example of um, a female footballer who's out there really giving her all to the game in every aspect. How do you think about your relationship with the fans? Like, how does it feel to be in a position where you're changing how your country is viewing the game? Yeah, I think it's a bit bizarre, I guess, because for me at the start of my career, that wasn't really a thing. And now it's like I've gone through that change of support and where the fans are with us and how many fans there are and everything like that is completely changed and it's kind of gone with the direction of my career. I will say it's a little bit different because also have the Barcelona fans who are very intense as well. Uh, it's amazing the fan base at Barcelona as well as England. So it's, it's kind of like two of the biggest clubs in the world and with these huge fans and huge following. Um, but I, I love the relationship we have with fans. It's obviously a little bit different now. I think years years and years ago it was a little bit more personable because there wasn't as many people. But now, you know, there's thousands every single game. It's You want to thank everybody. You want to sign everyone. You want to take a picture of everybody. But you just can't. There's just not enough time. But the fact that we've got these fans coming to games is amazing. Um, and I think the, the fans that we have in women's football really are very special particularly I feel it when I play for Barcelona and for England I could I honestly wouldn't train either of them for any other sets of fans <laughs> oh that's awesome I love that um okay if you just had one thing that women's football could focus on in 2024 what would it be I don't know I think I think a lot of people talk about the growth of the game and you know the increase of fans and and things like that I just want the game to keep getting better, like the teams to be better, like the players, individual players to be better in every single position. Like the games, I want to see amazing football every every single game that you watch, whether it's the Champions League final or a league game or what have you, to see just quality football being played uh, week in, week out. I think that's really what I want to see more than anything. I know, you're such a football purist. You just like love the game and you want to be challenged. I love that. I'm obsessed. I know. That's so cool. Lucy, this was so great. Thank you so much for coming on. No, thanks for having me. It was really enjoyable.